This will be a roller coaster. I recently made a video about Skia and Skiko and high performance image processing. However, on Blue Sky, Michael Powers wondered how much faster such a Skia shader based approach would be compared to his algorithm using Kotlin X coroutines. And while Kotlin X coroutines might be the fastest concurrency framework in this world, I prepared myself for a quick and easy win. It's image processing. Of course, the GPU will completely destroy whatever the CPU can do, right? Quick and easy benchmark, showing off really nice results, packaging that up as a video and being happy with the rest of my life. But is it really that easy of a win? Or will you see me getting humbled today? Hi, my name is Seb. I work at JetBrains as an engineer in the Kotlin team and you probably don't want to subscribe to this channel because I sometimes might say that I was wrong. Sometimes. This is the project in which we want to have those two algorithms, those two approaches compete with each other. We used this project to load two screenshots from the Kotlin Conf app and we produced this div image that showed us all the differences between those two screenshots. But before we actually can start writing proper benchmarks and seeing what approach is actually faster, it probably makes a lot of sense for us to extract the code into our own function called skier compare and come up with a reasonable baseline implementation, which we expect to be the slowest. To create our baseline function, we will use the buffered images and similar to our skia code, we will first allocate a new buffered image, go over every X and Y coordinate and then calculate the absolute difference between each color channel, putting that value back as a pixel to the result image. We can then run this code and see the result image, which looks exactly as the image before, which means we're almost ready for benchmarking. Obviously, one of the last things remaining is getting the code from Michael. So we just clone his repository, open his project and copy paste the relevant parts into our own source code. We create this coroutines compare wrapper function, which also just takes a buffered image as an input, another buffered image as an input and returns our diff image as a buffered image. Once we've done that, we can just call into that from our main function and just look at it seeing whether or not it produces the correct result. It looks a little bit different from what we have, but it's effectively doing the same thing. Now, without further ado, let's create the benchmarks and let's see what is actually faster. We can apply the Kotlin X benchmark plugin to our project, add the runtime dependency and declare our main benchmark target. After that, we can start writing our image diff benchmark. We do have to provide two functions, a setup and a teardown method. In the setup method, we will just load the images from disk and in the teardown method, we will just make sure to release all resources that we have used. For example, we should close the skier images. Now we can finally create a benchmark method for our baseline, one benchmark method for our skier based approach and one benchmark for the coroutines based approach. As the benchmark mode, I'm choosing throughput, aka how many images are we able to process per second. I'm choosing the throughput because it will be really easy for us to interpret how quick the algorithm actually is. We start round one by comparing our baseline versus the skier based implementation. We launch the benchmark, fast forward to our results, and we see that the baseline was able to process 34 images a second while our skier based approach was able to process 68. That is twice the amount of images processed per second. Let's go round two. We finally uncomment the coroutines based approach and compete directly against that. Let's see. I prepared myself for a quick and easy win. What the hell happened? The coroutines based approach is able to process over 1000 images where I was proud of being able of processing 70. There has to be something wrong. And the first place I'm going to look at is the activity monitor. I expect some GPU usage, or at least that's what I thought. If I look for the GPU time, there is basically no GPU used. 
If we look at the CPU, we see that the Skia-based approach uses 100% of our CPU and a lot and lots of memory. Okay, the memory leak is on me. I should have cleaned up some of this Skia resources that I've used. Once the result bitmap in the Skia compare function and also the result of our comparison needs closing as well. The second tool I'm using is the IntelliJ built-in profiler. We run the benchmark with the profiler attached and we will then look at the result. We see that most of our time is spent in the result canvas draw paint function, which further indicates that this shader is not actually running on the GPU, it is running on the CPU as well, which is kind of embarrassing, but also a little bit unfair. Our Skia benchmark uses 100% of our CPU, whereas the Coroutine Space one is using all cores 1200% CPU usage. Least we can do is allow our Skia based approach to use as many CPU cores as it likes as well. And this can be done easily by providing the add threads annotation to our benchmark, allowing for a maximum amount of threads, rerun the benchmark, and let's see, go for round three. And as we can see, we are getting close by having a result of 780 operations per second. But we're still using our CPU for Skia, which is not what it's intended for. So let's configure Skia to actually use the GPU. Instead of using a bitmap to draw on, we can create our surface with a render target. This requires a direct context to use the GPU, and we'll get to that later. Now we can just use the surface to draw and take an image snapshot later. But how can we create this direct context? I'm using macOS, so therefore I really want to use the Metal APIs. Let's see how we can create this Metal context. As you can see, it requires two native pointers, but there's not a single API in Skiku to get this pointers. So what are we going to do? Do we have to give up? Quick and easy win. Of course not. If there's no API on the JVM, let's just convert the project to multi-platform. We register the JVM target, move around the dependencies block, then move our source files from main source set to the newly called JVM main source set. Now let's create the native code, which is able to create this metal device and the command Q pointer. For this, we have to register our macOS ARM64 target and create our source file. Inside our native help IKT, we can finally use the native macOS APIs. We can create the metal device as well as the command Q. Now we only have to expose those pointers for later use in the JVM. We create those helper functions, metal device pointer and metal command Q pointer and we expose them using a C name. The last thing we can do is suppress the unused warning because we are not going to use that in that source set. But Zeb, how are we supposed to call into those functions as we defined them in the Kotlin native source set? For this, we could use the JNI or we could try out something pretty cool, pretty new. We are using the Java's new foreign function and memory API called FFM. First, we need to build our native binary. We define it as a shared library and call the link task. Once the binary is finally built, we can copy the absolute path. Yes, I know you should not use the absolute path, but this is a YouTube video. Then we need to make sure that this library is loaded in the JVM. We define a load library function and an atomic boolean is library loaded to ensure we're not calling this load function multiple times. Once the library is loaded, we can finally create our metal context. We use a thread local instance to ensure multi-threading. To use the FFM, we need a linker and a symbol lookup. Once we've done that, we can try to find our native functions using the down call handle method, where we have to provide the name of the function as well as its memory layout. In this case, we are providing a function descriptor of the type Java long. We can then invoke this function and cast the result as a long. We do the same thing for the metal command Q pointer and we finally got the two pointers we need and we can create the metal context. We wire up this metal context into our render target, execute the code, look at the result and what a disappointment. We are running on the GPU, but if you want to convert this image to a buffered image and look at it, it requires moving this image data from the GPU to the CPU. We cannot 
just access stuff stored in the GPU memory. But we can easily transfer this data from the GPU to the CPU by creating a bitmap again and reading the pixels into this bitmap. Executing this code again reveals that finally we can look at this image and it looks fine. Let's go into round four where we benchmark Skia actually doing its computations on the GPU versus the coroutines based solution. <sighs> this finally feels good. Skia is now able to perform 3794 images a second, whereas the CPU based solution is only able to process 1185 images. But why stop here? Let's run the profiler again. We launch the benchmark with the profiler and navigate to our skier compare function. And what we can see is really surprising. Almost all of our time, CPU time, is spent in reading the pixels from the surface to our bitmap. Meaning it's more expensive to transfer the memory from the GPU to the CPU than actually doing the computation. So I wonder what would happen in case we would not need the data available on the CPU side. We can therefore just remove the code that copies the image into the bitmap. And here we are in the final round five where we launched the benchmark with the GPU only version against the coroutines version. And there we have it. The GPU is actually faster than the CPU for image processing. What a relief. This was quite a roller coaster. I actually did not expect some of those intermediate results, nor did I expect the coroutines based solution to be so fast. But wow, is the GPU based solution fast. This is it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, have fun with Kotlin. Quick and easy win. <laughs>